is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hi, this is Pat Baldwin, head men's basketball coach at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Uh, money solves all problems. Every import player on the team had his own translator, and the coaches had their own translators. We had our own driver. We had our own cook. Money, money solves it. Chris Terrell is one of the only American basketball coaches to lead professional teams in the top league on the continents of North America, Europe, and Asia. Terrell has coached overseas for a decade in leagues such as CBA China, FIBA Europe, Latin America, Canada, and several of the more well-known minor leagues in the United States. This past season, he was the head coach for the Dallas Skyline in the Basketball League. Terrell also works with D1 Stars. Their Tournament of the Americas is globally connected with clubs and agencies, featuring the top pro talent. Don't miss our Hoop Heads Pod webinar series with some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com slash webinars to get registered. Make sure you check out our new Hoop Heads podcast network of shows, including Thrive with Trevor Huffman, Beyond the Ball, the CoachMaze.com podcast, and Cavaliers Central with Justin Matcham, our first podcast dedicated to covering the ins and outs of an NBA team. We're looking for more NBA podcasters interested in hosting their own show centered on a particular team. Reach out to me at Mike at HoopHeadsPod.com if you're interested in learning more and bringing your talent to our network. Be prepared to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Chris Terrell, international professional basketball coach. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunko. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast, Coach Chris Terrell. Chris, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. We are excited to have you on. You have such a diverse background in coaching and the places that you've been all over the world. Can't wait to hear more about that and how you ended up going to these various places and what some of your experiences were when you were there. I want to start out by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about your first experiences with the game of basketball and what made you fall in love with it. Yeah, I think elementary school yards, right? It was recesses. It was lunch times. It was every chance we could get. And, you know, kids were kind of all going in their own directions. We had kickball and tetherball and some kids actually ate lunch and, you know, all kinds of different things. But I was interested in the basketball court and so I headed in that direction and uh, yeah I just I just remember falling in love with it and dribbling all day and and you know just looking forward to getting better at basketball. Was there anybody that was an inspiration to you whether it was somebody in your immediate family or maybe somebody that you saw on TV was there a role model somebody that you looked up to when you were getting into the game at first? Yeah, for sure. So I, I grew up in the 80s in Los Angeles and Magic Johnson, 1980s, started at all five positions. And, you know, he was the uh, an unbelievable player that kind of broke out right at I was eight. So my early childhood on my teenage years was those Lakers runs. And that was definitely a big inspiration for me. So were you a Larry Bird fan or were you a Larry Bird hater during that time? I think I always respected his ability and his skill, great rivalry. You know, the games wouldn't have been as interesting if you didn't have a terrific team that you were playing against every year. And, yeah, between, you know, Bird and and you look at those Pistons teams in the late 80s, the bad boys, and then the Bulls came in, you know, around the end of the decade. Uh, A lot of good basketball. The Sixers in the 80s were were terrific. Uh, The Rockets. So, yeah, I loved the NBA as a kid. and. Grew up jumping up and down on my couch, uh, couch rooting for 
for Magic and the Lakers. <laughs> it's funny how you remember when you're a kid the teams and the players that resonate you with you. And certainly during that time, I think you were – if you were a kid during the 80s, you had – you were either a magic guy or you were a bird guy. I don't think there, there was anybody that sort of was neutral on that. And so I was always a magic guy, loved the Lakers, and just had a lot of disdain for the Celtics and Larry Bird. Didn't like him at all when I was a kid. And then obviously as I've matured into an adult, you look back at what Bird was able to accomplish and what the Celtics were able to accomplish and how good and talented and everything that you would want a basketball player to be, Larry Bird was that thing. But in the moment – I was definitely a ma- definitely a Magic guy. I loved watching the Lakers and always was rooting for the Lakers and that rivalry for sure. So you think about your time as a young kid coming up. What was it besides just the guys that you looked up to and, and that? What what was it about the game that maybe had you gravitate towards it as opposed to maybe another sport? Just the ability to to be able to work on it on my own. You know, all I really needed was a a basketball, and and I got one of those, and I'd play in my driveway. You know, I'd work on my handles. I I would go to the park. I'd ride the bus to, you know, go, you know, meet some other kids and play. You know, the 80s was a different thing, so I was kind of off, you know, adventuring the the city and and finding games and – uh, it was just more accessible. You know, I liked baseball. I, I played other sports, but it was much more structured in the sense that, you know, you need this giant field and you need all this equipment and you need coaches and you need X number of players. And basketball, it literally could just be, you know, me and a ball in the driveway dribbling for a couple hours. And I, I just loved it. I think that's something that when you talk to people who play different sports when they were younger and they gravitate towards basketball. I think one of the things that you often hear is the fact that I could do it on my own and I didn't need somebody else. If I wanted to go out and shoot for an hour or two hours, or I wanted to shovel snow or I wanted to shoot late at night, you could do that. Whereas, as you said, with baseball or football, you need some other people to be able to throw you the ball or play catch with or whatever the case might be. And I think basketball has a unique advantage there and that you can, really improve your game by yourself. And I think to a lot of kids who basketball is important to them when they're younger, they can put a lot of time in that it would be very difficult to put that same amount of time in, in a different sport. I wanted to ask you a little bit about multi-sport athletes. When you think about that from a coaching perspective today, and you look back on your experiences as a kid, how do you think being a multi-sport athlete impacts kids today because we know there's a lot of pressure on kids to specialize. So what do you see as a coach at the professional level? Do you look back that far at some of your players to see who was a multi-sport athlete and maybe how that impacts their performance down the road when they do decide to specialize in basketball? Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that that I always kind of look for uh, at the professional level is guys that, you know, everyone is skilled to a certain extent, but guys that, that, that have that physicality or, or, or bring the effort or are willing to do the, the dirty work kind of things, the, the guys that are good, you know, role players, the guys that will rebound and defend and be physical and bump screeners and all those types of things. And where I'm leading with that is other sports, contact sports, football, namely, but, you know, some others, hockey, et cetera. It, there's, an element to the sport of basketball that as we're transitioning more and more um, into a single sport type of athlete, I'm seeing less and less of the uh, certain things that you'd be more likely to find in, in players that were more diverse. So what are some of those things? Physicality, what else are you seeing that maybe a basketball only athlete is lacking that maybe somebody who played multiple sports might have? Yeah, so as an example, like, you know, you pick and roll away from a wing, and, and so that defender is responsible for drop and bump on the big that's rolling so that the big that's defending the ball screen can kind of help stop the ball until the guy that's getting screened gets back in front of it. And so it's teamwork, guys defending multiple positions. It's it's harder and harder as I've gotten later on in my career to find, you know, six foot three, six foot four guys that will – you know, get physical with a seven footer in the middle of the lane, just long enough so that his man can, can help. And, you know, so that help the helper stuff is important. Rebounding, you know, just, you know, closeouts, 
different things like that. I think there's a physicality that comes with other sports that when players are focused on basketball only, they might have the skill to play at higher levels, but they're just not interpositional in a way that multi-sport athletes are more apt to be. That makes complete sense. I think one of the things that I always find as a coach, and it's interesting because a lot of what I do as a coach or what I've done as a coach, I still tend to look back on myself as a player, even though I'm 50 years old, for some reason in my head, I still tend to think of myself more as a player, which I don't know what that says about me and my mental state. But regardless, when I think about coaching, one of the most difficult things that I've always struggled with is what you just mentioned in terms of being able to get players to play more physically and not shy away from contact. So I think of a specific idea where just a a simple concept, like and a lot of the coaching that I've done in the last 10 years has been with, let's say, eighth grade players and younger. But just a simple uh, simple drill or a simple skill would be offensive player passes the ball to the wing, defender guarding the player who passed it has to jump to the ball and then bump the cutter as the cutter goes down the lane and try to make the cutter go behind the defender. And I'll demonstrate that time after time after time. And I'll take my forearm and I'll bang the cutter who's coming down the lane. And then I'll put a kid in there and the kid will not, the defender will not touch the cutter for whatever reason. They just won't touch him. And I do think that there's something to be said for kids who played backyard tackle football, that they're not afraid of being physical. And I do think that that's something that we don't see as much in today's game, I find that more difficult to teach, and it sounds like you're seeing some of those same things. Yeah, it, it's a constant struggle, and, and every year it gets a little bit harder. And you know, a lot of I've gotten to the point where a lot of my scouting and and you know just finding players and talking to agents and going through videos and trying to figure out, you know, it becomes more about you know the innate qualities to 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 winning teams that I'm looking for than. You know, when I first started, it was really more, okay, how many points per game? What college did he go to? You know, it was, it it was more that type of, of scouting where these days I'm, I'm kind of thinking uh, more along the lines of, you know, I can teach them an offense. They're all going to be able to shoot. Let me find the guys that do the other stuff. So how do you go about determining that? Is that just you having a feel for watching tape on them, watching them play live and actually seeing those things? Are there, questions, things that you can ask when you talk to the players or the things you can ask their prior coaching staffs about them? How do you go about evaluating some of those less visible things? Obviously, we can all look at a score sheet and see, oh, this kid averaged 18 points a game. We can see what they shot from the field and what they shot from the line. But some of the things that we're talking about, the physicality or maybe the the mentality to be a good teammate are a little bit more intangible. So how do you go about evaluating those things in a player that you're looking at? Yeah, I think it starts with the video. You know, I like to watch uh, highlights just to kind of make sure that the player that I'm looking at is is someone that's worth watching a full game video on. And kind of once they've passed that stage, then I'll watch full game video. And I, I just really focus in on him throughout the, you know, the entire play on both sides. Defense is really important to me. And I think defense is the easiest way to find out whether or not they're going to do those things, right? Do they do they bump the cutters? Do they fight through ball screens? You know, do they do they lay down when they get screened and, and get taken out of the play too easily? Do they continue to make those second and third efforts? Do they rebound? Are, do they get on the floor, or, you know, loose ball situations? And so, you know, if I see enough in the full game video, then it typically goes on to the interview process. And with interviews, sometimes it's a little tricky to get guys to come out of their shell. I mean, most of these guys are, you know, young adults, um, maybe 22 to 30 years old is maybe kind of the, the range. And it's, it's hard to always kind of get what you want out of them immediately, but you learn the personality type and then, you know, continue to kind of ratchet up your, your questions to evoke a response. Yeah, I would think that it's difficult to always bat 100%. We know clearly scouting is an inexact science. So let's say that you end up with a player who maybe is struggling in some of those areas that we talked about. Let's just take physicality as an example. And so you have a guy that maybe you thought was going to 
bring that to the table but doesn't, or maybe you knew that that was going to be an area he was going to struggle with, but he has some skills in another area. How do you go about helping a player improve some of those intangible skills? You know, we're not talking here about the ability to dribble the ball or pass the ball or shoot the ball, but just more of those physicality and tangible being a teammate. How do you teach that as a coach? So I, I do it with a lot of drills. You know, one of my favorites is a uh, zigzag. We basically just, you're probably familiar, line up on the baseline, you know, offensive players, offense, defense off is kind of the rotation. And so a defensive player steps in front of the offensive player underneath the basket, you know, staring out of bounds on the baseline. And the offensive player could pick a direction, but I like the defense to kind of try and influence that. And then you're just trying to get your chest on the lead shoulder and slide your feet and stay in front of the ball, knowing that he cannot change directions until he gets to the sideline. And so you normally get two or three hard dribbles to the sideline, and then he's either got to go between his legs or around his back or a reverse pivot dribble to get off the sideline and start heading in the other direction. And it's at that moment where I'll teach them, um, all right, he can't keep going that way. You know he's going to do one of these three things. So take away the crossover. Don't let him dribble between his legs. If he goes around his back, steal it. And that's really only going to leave him with the reverse pivot. And what I want you to do is load up on that off leg and jump in the direction that you know he's got to pivot towards and try and, again, get your chest on that lead shoulder. If the defensive player can turn the offensive player five times before he gets to half court with the basketball, I'll blow the whistle. The offensive player has to run suicides defensive player then gets on the ball and I'm screaming and hollering and, and yelling and, and raising hell and and it, it really kind of ramps the guys up to get ultra competitive with it it improves their ability to be able to respond to, to ball pressure which helps us offensively ball handling but I, I'm really more than anything to your question trying to pull that intensity out of them and, and get them to really compete and if you make that a daily part of practice I've found it translates to the game. Yeah, I always wonder about toughness. You think about it from a coaching perspective, and you just, there are some players on your team that you can just quickly identify within the first hours, days of you knowing them or having them be a part of your team that this is just a tough kid. And then there are other kids that you know they're a little softer or they just maybe don't have the same level of intensity or work ethic or whatever it is. And so as a coach, I think that one of the things that we all try to do is figure out how can we get the most out of each player. So just maybe describe for us what your process is for getting to know your players over the course of a season and then trying to figure out what each one of them needs to be able to get the best out of them. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, so I, 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 I've read a lot about it, and I've gotten better at it over the years. You know, I really used to be, early in my career, kind of almost confrontational, where I was like, you know, that Bobby Knight kind of coach all the time with everyone. And, you know, what I found out was is that some guys really respond to that and play harder and compete and just love it, and then other guys just shut down. They can't take the pressure. It's too much. Uh, they go into a shell, and they don't play as well. And so. As I've, I've read, as I've gotten older, it's learning the personality types and what they respond to. And I, I forget what book it is, but there was something that I kind of kept a, a hold of that, that talked about that, you know, you, you, you could just reach out to someone and, you know, touch them on their shoulder or, or you could poke the bear is, a, is an expression. And, and, and some guys need, you know, more than others. And it's just learning what people respond to. But yeah, I have, I've learned to have to vary that because, you know, sometimes it's just too much for certain guys. They didn't get that at home. They're not used to it and they don't respond well to it. And, but other players are, are, are super receptive to a more aggressive approach. I try and get the guys to play hard. Like I, I want the most difficult thing in their lives to be my practice so that by the time that they get into the game, and they're just playing against, you know, some other kid that's their age. Oh, my God, this is easy. I, I, you know, I don't have coach screaming at me the whole time. I, I could just have fun. And it, it, it's, it, it's something that I've just, you know, kind of evolved into over the years. How long or how many years do you think it took into your career before you started to evolve and think about the fact that there might be 
more than just one particular way, like your style, the way you feel comfortable coaching may not work for everybody. Cause I think that's something that all coaches struggle with. Obviously you have to be yourself when you're coaching because players we all know can look through and see if you're a, a quiet, mild mannered coach and suddenly one day you're screaming and yelling, it's going to come across maybe not as genuine. And I think the reverse is true too. If you're someone who's always kind of loud and boisterous and, coaching in that manner and then suddenly one day you show up and you're super quiet and put your arm around everybody I think that kids look at that sometimes a little bit uh, skew as well so just talk a little bit about how you how long it took you to start to see that maybe you had to have a slightly different approach within your own personality type uh, when it comes to coaching I'm still learning you know it's like I haven't arrived it's with you know I think coaching a, a at any level it's just a constant process and it it it, it takes time and i i've I've come a long way but yeah i mean you gotta you know it's hard you what you want them to do is 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 exert more energy than they would on their own right it's to be more competitive that they than they would without you it's to it's to dive on the floor it's to get those loose balls it's to it's to make that those competitive things throughout the game and so you know I I think that what I've learned and gotten better at doing is developing relationships you know you got you got to love them a little bit you, you, you know you can't you can't just you know be the bad guy they have to see both sides of you and and that only I think players respond to a coach being who he is as long as they know that you have their best interest at heart and that you're trying to do right by them and so it's it's a little bit of both, but but you're right. It has to be, you know, genuine. It has to be from you. All right. So how do you establish those kinds of relationships with players where you get them to buy in and they do understand that you care about them as more than just a basketball player who can help them to win games? What are some of the strategies, techniques, things that you do to help you build relationships with your players? A uh, big goal and then work your way backwards. Uh, I've always found that, you know, you find a, a common ground that, that, the, that the player is committed to, whether that's playing in the NBA or that's making his high school basketball team or, you know, getting a scholarship or whatever it is, but you find that big goal. And then once you have that goal, then you kind of try and what I, what I try and do is, is work all the little steps back to where we are now to get there. And to talk through those things, and once the player sees that you're trying to help them accomplish their goal, and you're simply trying to, from your experience, help them outline the thousands of little steps between, you know, A and B, they're going to be more receptive to some of the things that it takes in order to get them where they want to go. That's a great way to look at it. I think that. I had a conversation with J.P. Nurbin, who is a uh, – he consults with coaches all over the world about just helping them to build winning cultures and championship teams. And I remember one of the things that he said that relates to what you were just talking about in terms of starting with this larger goal in mind. And what he said is that he tries to get his coaches to have those same conversations with players and then ask them, okay, well, if that's what your goal is – Let's take a look at what you're actually doing to try to reach that goal. Let's see if your actions match up with the goal that you're trying to accomplish. And oftentimes he would say that, you know, coaches will have those conversations and the player will have a goal, but their actions aren't necessarily leading them towards accomplishing that goal. And so then his recommendation to coaches is then at that point, this is basically what you said is, all right, how can I help you? to reach your goal? What can I do to put you in a position to reach that goal? How can I help give you actual action steps that you can take in order to reach that goal? And I think that's got to be something powerful for players to hear their coach say to them, hey, if you want to get here, these are the things that you have to do. And that's sort of the coach in that facilitator role in terms of helping their individual players improve. And then you also obviously at the same time have to balance between the team goals and the individual goals of a player. So how do you do that as a coach? How do you balance the team goals with the individual goals of your players? 
Yeah, so it's it's different at different levels, right? So when when I was coaching high school or, or junior college or something like that, AAU ball, a lot of times the players that you have are, are the kids that live in your district and the ones that, you know, come to your tryout. And so you kind of have to work with what you got more often than not. One of the advantages at the professional level is, you know, more and more I'm able to, to pick guys that have – specific skill sets who inherently want to do the things that the team needs for them to do to, to win. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think that as you get into a coach and obviously you have your philosophy and you have the things that you're trying to accomplish at a team, and then you look at each individual's skill set and what they can bring to the table and then how that can impact you completely as a team, what individual things that they bring to the table. Let's go back in time to when you first got into coaching. When did you know that you wanted to make coaching your life's work? Was it something that you always knew from the time you were young, or was it something that came to you once you were kind of done playing, you started looking around and saying, hey, I want to still stay involved in the game? At what point did you realize you wanted to be a coach? I can think of two points probably. So one, when I was, I don't know, eight, nine years old, my mom was working two jobs. I, I lived with her. They had gotten divorced when I was much younger, when I was two. And she'd come home late from her second job. So right after school, latchkey kid, I'd jump on the bus and go to the park. Um, and I'd play basketball, you know, until dark. And, and then, you know, after dark, come home. The way that I was able to play in those leagues, often registration-wise, was volunteering to coach a younger age group. So when I was eight or nine years old, I was coaching the six-year-olds. When I was 10, I was coaching the seven-year-olds. And so that was always kind of a part of what I did in order to continue to be able to play in all those leagues. And then I think it was you know much later in life, early 20s, I was coaching a 13 and under AAU team and I would literally this you know park and recreation center in you know northern Los Angeles San Fernando Valley I would literally go to the games in a suit and tie <laughs> I would have like structured practices that where you know like people would literally laugh laugh at me and, and say you know who do you think you are are you Phil Jackson or something you know these are 13 year old kids and you know it, I, I was driven, yeah, immediately and, and, and mocked for it. What was it about coaching that you loved so much? Was there one particular part of it that stood out? Was it the challenge of competing? Was it the X's and O's? Was it, was it the players? Was it something else? What was it that you really liked about it? Yeah, this sounds funny. I really don't know how to articulate it. But it, it, when I was a little kid, you know, all my friends played Atari or in television or whatever the video games of the day were, right? Well, my video game was coaching the kids that were three years younger than me. And, like, that was me playing. It, it was, hey, you go over here and you do this and, and we're going to score and I'm, I'm kind of pressing the buttons a little bit, right? And that's why I'm using the video game analogy. It just, it, I don't know, the com competitive aspect of it and the teamwork and the camaraderie and winning, and I loved it. I just, I loved it immediately. What's something that you feel like, even from those early days when you were coaching, and maybe not so much when you were coaching when you were 10, coaching seven-year-olds, but when you were in your mid-20s and you were coaching AAU basketball, what's something that you feel like you had a natural affinity for some part of coaching that you were pretty good at right from the very beginning? Reading counter. I used to just sit for hours and just, you know, diagram plays, you know, if, if they show you slip, if they trail, you curl, if they cheat, you flare, if they trap, then, you know, slip and mid post and, like all those read counter options is what I saw well, you know, kind of time space on the court, bunches of X's and O's. I, I would just spend hours and hours on it. At that point in your life, did you get an opportunity to watch, were you watching any film to break down whether it was film of your own team or just were you watching maybe NBA games and trying to break stuff down or was that not really what you were doing at that point? Because obviously it was a lot more difficult to watch film then than it is now. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, this is pre-YouTube, pre-Facebook, pre-Internet. It, it was, you know, watching uh, the NBA on NBC. And, you know, we had a VCR. I, I would tape games, and then I would play back plays, and I would later in the game see the same play, but the defense defended it slightly differently, and so the offense was able to counter. And it, it, it didn't happen all at once, obviously, but – over the years, I got better and better at that and with, you know, the internet and YouTube and lots of other things that, you know, jump by leaps and bounds. But yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the bottom line of it. You're, you're way better than me because I was just replaying John Tesh's intro over and over again back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good song. It's catchy. It's very catchy. It's, catchy. it's very catchy. Well, I think when you think about film and – Jason's a little bit younger than you and I, but I, uh, my recollection of film, and I got out of high school coaching, about, uh, it's probably been 10 years now. So I got out right before sort of the revolution in film work. And so when I, when I think of film, I still think of both as a player and in my coaching career of having the VCR and hitting the rewind button and having it go a minute past the play that I wanted to see and then trying to jump ahead and then having to watch two extra minutes of the play to get back to the play I wanted to see and just how brutal it was to be able to watch any film. And obviously now it's so much easier. So when you're watching film with one of your teams, how much time do you spend watching your own team play, let's say during the season? How much, what percentage of the time do you spend watching your own team's film and trying to analyze what you're doing? versus how much time you spend watching opponents film trying to prepare for them or prepare for your next game? Ooh, that's a good question. I'd say probably 75-25 next game. I, I'm, I'm always kind of looking ahead, but, you know, that percentage will change based on result too, right? Like I hate to say that, you know, you, you, you work harder, you study more when you lose, but it, it's true. It's just human nature it's something really is bugging you and it's getting on your nerves and you're like god we got out rebounded and how are we going to fix this or the you know the help side isn't coming quick enough and where's my drop defender and you know in your mind that you didn't you know make something happen like you should have as a team in the game and so you play back the video to try and you know learn what those lessons are that you carry with you to, to practice the next day how much Film work do you share with your players during a typical game week or preparation? So in other words, if you're going to watch film, you as a coach, how much do you watch compared with how much tape do you show to your players? That doesn't count them watching on their own or having access to the video, but how much are you actually sitting down together as a team or maybe with one individual player and showing them the film compared to how much you're watching? That, uh, that's something that I've gotten better at over the years. I think in the beginning, I, I was just overboard. You know, I would, you know, we'd go, you know, morning shoot around and then we'd go to the weight room and then we'd come back to the facility and we'd watch our full game video and I'd keep stopping it and, you know, comment and teaching points and draw things on the boards. And now we're going to watch the next team's full game video. Like I was just too much and they, they couldn't retain it all. And it, it, it was, I, I, I was overboard. So, over the years, I've, I've realized that I need to pare it down into teachable moment, moments that they can carry with them to the next game. And so if I'm making a point about our game, then I've got my entire message broken out in four or five plays that kind of speak to the things that we're going to work on in practice that address those issues moving forward. And then for the next opponent, it's similar. Four or five sets typically – Maybe one defensive possession to give you kind of their overall shell as to as how they defend as a team, but maybe four offensive plays that that we want to try and break counters that we want to force them to go to. So I I paired it way back. If I can get both done in an hour, that's awesome. Uh, early in the week, it depends on the league or the country or whatever. If it's a if it's a Friday Saturday game schedule and you've got all week to practice, then that first day back from the rest day, if there's travel and then a rest day, then maybe we're in practice on a Tuesday. That first hour of practice on Tuesday is, is, is getting ready for the week. And that's when I go over those things. 
So you've obviously coached in a lot of different places and a lot of different levels, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But just when it comes to film work, does it does it matter in terms of obviously pro guys who that's their only job, they have more time to be able to look at film than a high school team does. But if you were just in general, let's say that it's the year 2020 here and you're coaching a team at the college level, the professional level, the high school level, is there an ideal amount of film that you would want each of those different levels to see? Could the pros, in other words, handle watching more video and retaining more of it than the high school players? Just what might be your philosophy for those different levels in terms of the amount of film that you'd share with players? Yeah, great question. So I, I think like school, right, like it, it gets harder as you go. You know, the math that you're going over in third grade is very different than, you know, the math that you're doing in 11th, et cetera. And so the, the way that, that a lot of players learn the game and how much information you're able to give them, the deeper meaning of plays, breaking down options, reads and counters, those types of things, I think the older that they get late in their careers, you know, 30 to 35 years old, the guys that are able to, to hang on that long, you know, some of these guys are future coaches. You can really go into a lot of detail. So, you know, to answer your question, I, I, I think at the high school level, I, I kind of, I want to pare it back. I don't want to overload the guys. I don't have anywhere near as much time. I need to be on the court as much as possible. So I, I would probably break it down to um, a couple of things that we did in the game that, that I want to try and correct and maybe a teachable moment that I'm really proud of that we've been working on and that we're getting better at and end it with the positive moment. And just a side point, the younger guys need the encouragement. You know, it, it, after a while you get kind of a thicker skin when, when you're a pro basketball player, but you know, younger players really need the pat on the back too. So I, I'd always try and end it with something that, you know, I'm really proud of them, you know, for doing, you know, something that we've been working on as a team that they've accomplished now and that we're in, we're improved at, but pare it down, I guess, is my message. And then same thing with the future opponent, maybe two plays that they run a lot that, you know, okay, they're going to run the ball screen to the right and he's going to roll the basket. And then this guy's going to replace the top of the key ball reversal and side screen and roll. And so I want you guys to, you know, black on this ball screen. And then, you know, I want you to ice on this one and just, you know, kind of little mini things to carry with you then on the court to the to the practice to get ready for the next opponent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to ask you, you kind of touched on it a little bit. What would you say would be your ratio, for lack of a better way of saying it, of positive to negative things that you're showing your team? So if you're watching your own film and you're analyzing your own performance, how much are you showing at players a play where you say, hey, this is how we're going to defend the screen roll. This is exactly how we want it done versus – oh, man, look at how player X got caught up in the screen and didn't get around and, you know, the big guy didn't step out and hedge and control the ball handler. How much of you? How much of what you're showing is positive plays that you want your players to emulate and how much of it is mistakes that you've made that you want them to correct? Yeah, uh, again, I'm kind of probably a little overboard on everything. I'm, I'm you know, confrontational and, and, and aggressive. And if I'm upset, they know it. Like. You know, I'll be upset in, in a video session and I'll, I'll put, you know, rules in place and I'll make demands, you know. Hey, you guys, everybody knows. Is there anybody in this room, raise your hand, that does not know that when they set a ball screen at the top of the floor that the big defending the screener is going to jump out and hedge and then he's going to roll back to the basket with his hands above his head. Like, we all know to do that, right? And I've just shown you three times in the video where we're not doing that. So here's the deal. Everybody wants to play. If you don't do your job, sup. Are we clear? Yeah, I don't think there's any way that you can <laughs> be a player and not get that message. Although it's amazing. We all know as coaches, and even if you're still a player, you know you have teammates that there's things that are abundantly clear or certainly seem abundantly clear, and yet players don't always get that message. And that always has been something that has been kind of amazing to me. And yet we all know that there's all different kinds of players in terms of their – ability to listen and their ability to be disciplined and to do the things that coaches are asking. And as a coach, again, like we talked about earlier, it's your job to be able to figure out how do you go about getting to be sure that all your players are going to do the things that you want them to do in order for your team to be successful. Let's talk a little bit about the start of your coaching career and 
what you thought your career path was going to be in coaching when you first started and then give us an idea of your first coaching job and what that first real experience was like going beyond just coaching you know younger kids in a rec league or at the AAU level. Uh, yeah, so I coached high school and uh, junior college, just kind of one year of each. And then I started doing a semi-pro travel ball. We got an opportunity to play a USBL team. Uh, it, they're defunct now, but United States Basketball League back in the, I think this was early 2000s, was a semi-pro, you know, guys making $500 a week or type, type money to, to play basketball. And we traveled across the country. I took a team from Dallas to Melbourne, Florida to play the Brevard Blue Ducks. And we, we got DVDs of, of two games. We played them back to back. And I loaded the videos online on, on YouTube and then put them on a, a website and then started pasting all over social media. I think it was MySpace at the time or whatever, but <laughs> that's kind of when I really felt like, oh my God, I could go to the NBA. I, I really started thinking bigger. You know, I'd coached in high school, I'd coached in college, I'd kind of gotten my feet wet. I, I thought I was pretty good at it. You know, we won at those two levels and I was moving up quickly. And now I was starting to get guys that were former Division One athletes, you know, true size too. You know, I think that team that we took to Florida, my small forward was 6'10". You know, I had a couple big body guys at, at, at four and five. I had a, a shooter at 6'3 that, you know, played the point. And I, I just, you know, I started getting excited about the possibilities. And teams started reaching out to me from, you know, social media and, and just, you know, kind of pasting, you know, links all over the place. And I started getting phone calls. And my very first job, I think, which was a part of your question, a team in Mexico in a league called Ciba Copa. It's the circuit of professional basketball on the Pacific coast of Mexico. It's, I don't know, a 12-team league or something. It's, it's not big money, a two $3,000 a month type uh, jobs for players at that time in that league. It's more now. But they contacted me. They wanted two of the guys that they saw playing for me and for me to come coach. And uh, I think it was 2005 was my first pro job. And it was with Marineros de Guaymas in the, in the Ciba Copa League. All right. So I got two questions related to that. So the first one is, how did you get the opportunity to put together that team that you took to Melbourne? Because if you had been coaching at the high school level and coaching at the JUCO level, how does the connection come to pass that gives you the opportunity to go and do that? Let's answer that part first, and then I'll jump to my second question after you answer that. Yeah, you're right. I skipped a whole step and an important one, too. A guy by the name of Willie McRae, it's a, a, a Christ-based organization called the Dallas Diesel. They were a semi-pro organization, and one of my players, this guy named Kelvin Williams, was a six foot eight, 270 pound post player. And he was starting to practice with the Dallas Diesel. And I decided to go down there. I started talking to Coach McRae and kind of one thing led to another, but he already had three or four guys that were coming to practice. And I started working with them. And once I got involved, you know, I, I've always been real active on uh, social media, whether it was MySpace or Facebook or you know, now with, you know, Twitter, Instagram, not as much as I'm getting older, but earlier in my career, I was super active with that. I was always posting videos and liking videos and making contacts with players, pretty heavily involved in the local pro-am circuit where I got to know players that had just graduated college and or were still in college and, you know, building my contact base. And I was always good at, at recruiting. Like, you know, once I got someone on the phone and talked about you know, hey, you know, we're going to do this and we're working on that. And, you know, I always had big aspirations and talked a good game. And, you know, players came out and, and supported the program and the rest is history. So did you realize at that point as you started having these conversations and getting these opportunities, prior to that, were you even aware of sort of this minor league level of basketball? Was that something that you 
knew about? And then it, when you ended up getting the opportunity to go and coach in Mexico, did you also think about the fact that you're, did you ever see yourself coaching in a foreign country? So one, were you aware of the minor league basketball circuit, so to speak? And then two, did you ever see yourself as you started your coaching career coaching in another country? Yeah, I, it's not black or white, It kind of a gray answer. So when I was a little kid, you know, back in L.A., they would always have runs at UCLA or at Pierce College or, you know, other places in California where a lot of players would come, whether it was, you know, there's a lot of good players from L.A., Paul Pierce, Gilbert Arenas, you know, Magic and several of the Lakers would go to UCLA all the time and play, Reggie Miller, uh, Adonis Jordan, Stuart Gray. There were so many guys, and so I always looked up to those guys. I, I loved the NBA. I wanted to be involved and go hang out where they were in the summers. And so I remember in Long Beach at the Pyramid, you know, 25, 30 years ago, where I, I started seeing more and more of that. They would have the, the Pangos and the Adidas and the, and the different type of, you know, pro summer league type events. And so it's kind of always been in the back of my mind that that was the next logical step after, you know, high school and college to make my journey to the, to the NBA. And that was kind of my goal. So getting an opportunity to go and coach in Mexico, what was that like? What was it like your first experience being in a foreign country, coaching in a foreign league? What did you like about it? What were some of the challenges that you faced? Oh, wow. I mean, Mexico is, is it, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, so much fun. The, the people are wonderful people. I love the food. I love the culture. I, I love everything about Mexico. The, 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 the fans, they call them fanaticos, you know, fanatics. They, they are. They're just, you know, beer sponsors were always the, the, the big, the big uh, money producer for the team. And it, just the whole atmosphere of, of the game there, the spectacle, as they call it, 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 it it's exciting. You know, dancers and, and, and loud music and and beer and, you know, parties after you win. And it, it was crazy. Language barrier a factor or no? No. So I took Spanish for two years. I think it was seventh and eighth grade, if I remember correctly. And so I, I had some broken Spanish and I was quick to, to pick it up. I'm, I'm bilingual. Oh, that's awesome. That that's, I'm sure as you got into it, it's a tremendous advantage to be able to speak the language, be able to communicate with all your players. What was the best part of that first year coaching at the pro level? Benny West is a guy that's from here in Dallas, and Brandon Lee is also. They were two of the guys that played for the Dallas Diesel for me on that, in that Melbourne game. Just seeing those guys succeed, you know, they were both all-stars. Benny led the league in scoring and was the slam dunk champion. We had a good season, you know, great guys, and – I don't know. The whole thing was a blast. Uh, it's really hard being away from home, but it was a blast. All right. So let's kind of walk through each of the stops that you've had along the way. Cause you've been in a lot of different places, a lot of different countries, and I'm going to let you kind of walk us through the timeline. Maybe just give us a detail or two uh, at each spot. And then if I have something I want to jump in on, I'm going to do that. But I want you to be able to just kind of take us through, some of the highlights of some of the places you've been and things you've been able to do. And I'll hop in with questions. Okay. Yeah. So it started in Ciba Copa in Mexico. And then I came back to the Dallas area and I coached a team called the Texas Tycoons. We went to the ABA championship game against the Vermont Frost Thieves. Will Voigt was their head coach. Uh, he coached in the G League and I think he's now in China, but their team was run by Sports Illustrated. Uh, great season, 25 and five, went to the ABA championship game. And then I went to the LMVP in Mexico. Uh, that's Liga Nacional. That's rather than just the coastal league of Mexico, that's the big mainland league for, for Mexico. And then I went to China. I got an opportunity to be an assistant coach in the CBA, Chinese Basketball Association. That's their top league. That was a wacky experience. I'll just kind of hit on that one real quick. Two NBA imports, both first-round draft picks. I had Javaris Crittenden, famous for the gun incident with Gilbert Arenas. <laughs> yep. He was one and done at Georgia Tech, first-round draft pick of the Lakers. I He played three years in the NBA. His very first 
overseas team he played for was with me. And then I had uh, PJ Ramos, seven foot five, first round draft pick, Puerto Rican guy for the Washington Wizards. Same story, three years in the NBA. First job after his NBA stint was in China with me. Both guys were making 60 grand a month. So I, I had gone from, you know, semi pro going to Florida, a bunch of guys getting in a bus with pizza money to in three, four or five years, pretty quickly it had gotten to a pretty decent level in the game. And then two years FIBA Europe, I was in Romania and really enjoyed that time. I'm going all over the place, guys. I'm sorry. I wanted no, to you're, comment about <laughs> No, you're good. Go ahead. Go ahead and go through it and just anytime jump a comment. I got I have I have a question, but I'll let you finish kind of what you're what you're talking about and anything you want to throw in of what the experience is that you've already talked about. Yeah, I was just going to say China was not a different country. Like, that's literally a different planet. I had these grandiose ideas that it was nothing but, you know, Panda Express. And I, yeah, everything from the food to the culture to the people, just it's foreign isn't the word. It, it, it's, it's alien. Um, I mean, great people. I, I love the Chinese people, but very different than Western society in so many ways that, that people wouldn't understand unless they spent months there to – to really get a feel for it. But what's, what's, what's one or two things in China that you, that stood out for you that you're like, wow, this is just completely different to the way of life that I'm used to. Just normal everyday life, just massive humanity, like people and cars and motor scooters and bicycles and chickens and just <laughs> all intersecting. It's, it's, it's wacko people. Oh my God. A lot of people, we thought, you know, America was a big country. China's got us beat different, right? Like uh, uh, Americans are known to be, you know, boisterous and outgoing and, you know, Chinese are, and I don't mean the stereotype, but just kind of overall speaking about, you know, cultural differences between countries and not, you know, individuals, but very reserved, w look down when they're walking, um, not as quick to say hello to strangers, the interactions and the interpersonal it is 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 very different. And then food. I I, I said it wasn't Panda Express, and it, it, not even close. Like it's it, it isn't anything that I've ever eaten before. And some great things, and some really weird things that you know I I just I wouldn't do again. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was an experience. I'm glad that I did it. It was an awesome experience. Great level of basketball. I I, I would say other than maybe Euro League, that the CBA in China has you know probably more NBA players than any league in the world other than the NBA. What was the language barrier like there? Because obviously you don't speak Mandarin Chinese. So how did you overcome that? Uh, money solves all problems. Every import player on the team had his own translator and the coaches had their own translators. We had our own driver. We had our own cook. Money, money solves it. So just for people who might be curious, Without putting a dollar figure on it, what does the salary of a head coach in the CBA look like, the salary of an assistant coach look like? What might that be comparable to in terms of levels here in the United States, just so people can have a feel for what that looks like just monetarily? It's not the NBA, but it's not the G League either. It's, it's, it's somewhere in between, you know, a top a top level head coach in EuroLeague or China could make a million dollars a year. And, you know, someone that's maybe less proven, an assistant, but, but still an import, you know, someone that they're flying in and getting a, a visa and, you know, value pretty highly in order to bring them to their, their country and the expenses involved with doing that on the low end, 50 grand. And I realize that's a huge range, but I'm, I'm going everywhere from, you know, assistant, new guy to, you know, proven championship level head coach. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. When you think about your experience in China, Mexico, Europe, some of the coaches that you may have been exposed to either when you're an assistant looking at them as head coaches or when you're a head coach, I'm assuming that maybe you had an assistant or two that were from their native countries. Were there things that you learned from a basketball standpoint in each of those places? Maybe it could just be as simple as, some training methods or drills or just something that was done differently 
than maybe what you were used to here in the United States? Is there one or two things that you can point to that you picked up along the way from those experiences? Yeah, I think uh, we were just talking about China. They're great with the video. I, I really got a lot better with breaking down video, breaking down sets, drawing things up. I think they spent more time on that than anywhere I'd, I had been prior to that. And so that was fun. I, I also think that the younger group, uh, youth groups, and, and not, not to bring politics into this, but the, it plays a factor. They're actually able to pull kids out of school that are 13, 14, 15 years old and put them into a school in another part of the country that, that's primarily basketball based. And so when clubs are able to develop kids at a younger age within their own program, and kind of have an, a, a little bit of overseeing their development, it's different than in the United States where the AAU, like they don't even practice some of the, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, the coaches, and I'm not picking on AAU coaches out there, there's a lot of really good ones, but there's also some that are kind of more glorified agents helping kids get into college and, and working angles uh, that, that's different in China where uh, it was really about developing the basketball player for their long term because that kid was going to grow up and someday play on that CBA team in China. I think it's interesting that a lot of the rest of the world has that academy model, for lack of a better way of saying it. I know that that's something that at least Mark Cuban, I know from the Mavericks, has talked a little bit about the fact that the NBA, I think, would like to see that model in some way, shape, or form come here to the United States. Do you think that that's something that is at all feasible here in the United States at some point? Obviously, it's not going to happen overnight, but do you see a day when NBA teams are sort of running their own academy, their own schools for that 12 to 18-year-old top prospect type of player? I do see it coming. So there's a team in the, in the TBL of the Basketball League which I consider to be, you know, maybe the third highest level of professional basketball in the United States after the NBA and the G League. They've got an organization called Creating Young Minds, CYM. They played in the TBL as the Louisville Yellow Jackets, and they pride themselves in bringing kind of that, that European uh, development aspect to their organization. They, they began as an organization that helped high school players finish up their high school education, and then help them get in line for college scholarship opportunities. And then they just this past season as that group of kids, I think they've been around since 2011 or 2012, something like that. But as those um, kids have become young men and, and matured in their program over the years, they've now added the, the, the minor league basketball team to their, to their business model. And, I, I think it's neat. You know, it, it, the, the thing that's intrinsic about it that, that I really am, am supportive of is it's not a one-and-done mindset of, hey, I just want to win this one game. I just want to get them into this college. I just want to, you know, do this one thing. It's not about this one tournament. It's, it's the thought that, no, I want to do what makes the most sense for this kid and his career over the long term because – you know, I wanted to develop them from 13 to 25. And it, that, that longer view at the, at the athlete and, and, and what they want to accomplish along with it often brings a certain type of, of thoughtfulness about them and, and, and their career that would be different than someone that's just their coach for that summer, as an example. Yeah, that's 100% true. What do you think of – when you say focusing on the long-term development of the athlete over the course of 10 to 15 years, depending on how long the kid stays in the program and when they get there, what are some things that in your mind would be examples of a long-term focus that a club that's structured that way might do compared to a normal, typical AAU program where the kid's playing from the time they're whatever. I mean, you could take it down to elementary school, but up through junior high, high school, whatever. Just talk about what the difference would be in terms of short-term versus long-term development of a player in the academy model. 
So <clears throat> I'm, I'm almost reticent to answer this question because I'm, I'm a win guy. Like I, I, I value winning over almost anything else. But <clears throat> to answer your question, the real advantage of the academy model is that it isn't just about this one game, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate. If, if, if it is just about the short term and you're just focused on winning now, well, there's one player on the team that's probably better than everyone else, and let's just get him the ball, right? And everybody else, you just kind of play off of that. And minutes and opportunities and the sets that you run – and everything that you do as a team, if it's focused on winning, is going to center around one or two kids. And the thing that I think is really harmful is that if a player, as an example, he's six foot three at 13 years old, and he's you know 180 pounds, and a lot of other kids haven't hit their growth spurt yet, and he's a pretty big kid, and you can get him the ball down the block, and he's strong at that age, and he can score. And there might be other players on that team that if they had a little bit more opportunity, that they were featured in the system, if they ran offensive sets and had structured practices and, you know, had certain things throughout their offense that taught varying skill sets for players at, you know, multi-positions or positionless basketball that would bring out the abilities of many players on the team, including that kid. I mean, that kid, may only grow another two inches in his whole life. And, and he's going to realize real quick that when he's a senior in high school and he's 6'5", that he's done. Like, you know, he can play with his back to the basket, but, you know, you're six four and a half, you're, you're done. The, the idea that you're developing for the long term is, is, is different than that for, for, for all those reasons I discussed. So it's the player that, you know, needs to work on his ball handling or the kids that need to get up more shots or, you know, everyone in this system being able to get a chance to come off screens and to, you know, get shots and play and make reads and counters and do different things and show what they can do. Practices that give everyone an opportunity to do things. But even going back to that best player on the team that was the focus of the short term model, he maybe he, because it's not just about winning, is also put in opportunities where he can step out on the floor and maybe he can put the ball on the floor a little bit. Maybe he can play a little wing. Maybe, you know, he works in a motion offense where he comes up, you know, to the top of the key and ball reversals and, and does different things out on the floor instead of what wins a game today is no, just put him on the block and give him the ball 25 times a game. Everyone just cut and get open and we're going to win. Yeah, I think that's really an interesting way of approaching basketball development because I think that one of the problems that we have today, and it not just is a basketball problem, but I think it's just a problem with how it impacts the kids' lives who are playing basketball. And a lot of times this comes from parents, families, people who are around the kids, is that everything in youth basketball is really geared towards one thing, and that's the opportunity to earn a college scholarship. And you see so many kids who are focused only on that one thing. And they're not focused on their development as players. They're not focused on getting more out of the game than just trying to get that scholarship. And so often what I'll see is that kids are playing and they're not, they're not enjoying or taking the time to really appreciate what they have in the moment. There's so many kids who – they're just their high school career is all about trying to get a scholarship. And we all know that there's many, many kids who would love to have a scholarship that fall short of that goal. And then they miss out on what could be a really good experience playing high school basketball, which you, know, you can talk to a lot of players, coaches, people who are of different ages. And many of them, even if they achieved at a very high level, look back on their time as a high school player as being one of the most enjoyable that they've had. And I think in a lot of ways, our system, the way it's set up now, robs kids of that ability to just enjoy what they're doing. And I think the academy model could kind of bring that back, where, as you said, if we're not focused on winning every single game, every single day, and trying to just pigeonhole people into winning where they are, but instead we're focused on that long-term development, I could see where that not only could that develop better basketball players, but I think it could develop – Potentially, if it was done right, it could also develop healthier 
human beings that are more focused on enjoying the process of being a part of it instead of always focused on what's at the end, which is what I see way too often in youth basketball today. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, I agree with you a thousand percent. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm talking out the other side of my mouth now. But when I was that coach at AAU, remember, I was the guy in the suit and tie that thought he was Phil Jackson. I, I, I wanted to win every game that I could and take every advantage that I possibly could to move up in my career. And, and without winning, I wouldn't have done that. So I'll just say that, you know, it, you have to work it, within the system. You have to work within the system that you're in. I think that's where, that's, yes. where co- that's where coaches are. And I think that's where players are too. And rightfully so you can't, you know, we can, we can argue about whether the system that we have set up is the right one. We can argue about, the NCAA one and done rule, whether it's a good rule or it's not a good rule for coaches, for players, for the NBA, whatever. Now this new thing with the G League, which is going to give guys an opportunity instead of going to college, they can go to the G League. All those things are things that players, coaches, parents, families have to navigate the system that they're in. And I think that's 100% true. So if you're a coach, you're right. If you're coaching AAU basketball and you never win, you're not going to move up from those positions because you developed great human beings. And yet at the same time, I'm a huge proponent in you have to use basketball as a vehicle to make kids' lives better. But yet winning, we all know at whatever level it is, especially for those of us who are competitive as players, as coaches, winning becomes important. It always is going to be important to us. It's just a matter of I think there's different ways to go about winning and there's different ways to I don't want to say define winning, but I think you can win on the scoreboard and at the same time win in the development of your players as human beings. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head, right? Like it, it, it all has to do with the, the, system, the system that's in place. And if, if my opportunity at younger youth levels was within a, an organization that had a model to develop players for the long term and really kind of took more of that academy approach, then within that system, I would have adapted and uh, what our goals were and what we were trying to accomplish, you know, adapt with it. And so you're right, as coaches, we just, you know, we're given a job to do and we do it to the best of our abilities. But the, the organizers, the, the, the managers, the, the, the people that sponsors and and get involved with these organizations that are setting the framework and, and the rules of the organization and, and, and how it's based and, and, and the way that it works, if, if those people come together and put something in place that does take all those things into account that we were talking about for their development long term, I, I think it helps the kids. It, it helps the sport. It helps our country. You know, come Olympic time, the gap is, it, it, it is, is, is not as wide as it used to be with us and other countries. And I think that the academy and the way that they're developed abroad it has a, a lot to do with that. Yeah, and I think you're you're starting to see some momentum for that. Like I said, I've I've read I've read articles where the NBA definitely is I'm sure studying and looking at it and trying to determine whether or not it's a model that they think can be feasible here in the United States. And USA basketball in a lot of ways is trying to take the lead in reforming and revamping youth basketball across the country and it's it's gonna be a long, difficult effort to try to be able to do that simply because of all the adult business interests that are a part of our youth basketball system today. But I do think that there, if you have the NBA and you have USA basketball behind those efforts, that there may be a time where we do see more of that academy model developing some of the best players in the world. And then we also have, conversely, there's a lot of people who, a lot of kids who play basketball, not because, again, they're going to be end up being NBA players but just because same reason you and I fell in love with it because it's a great game that you can play and practice by yourself and have fun. And so you had to provide those opportunities in the right setting, and the right system for people. So it's just interesting to see, and for you who's been all over the world, to see how different countries and different basketball systems go about developing players and putting together their pro leagues and the ages that you can do all those things and so on and so forth. So let's keep moving. That was a great tangent. So let's keep moving through your coaching career. Let's keep moving yeah. through and, and let's get to some of your next stops. 
Okay, so I think after, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, after Romania for two years, I coached in, in Mexico again. And then I was in Canada. And it was six years ago now. So uh, I'll, I'm going to give you my, my kids' ages, and then I'll, I'll explain where I'm going with that. My, my son is now 13, and my daughter is six. So when my wife was pregnant with my daughter, I had an opportunity to, you know, I was going to another team. I had my American import players picked out, and I thought it was going to be a good team. I had my flight and had my bags packed. I was super excited about this next uh, season, and my wife kind of sets me aside, I don't know, a couple of days before I was due to fly out, and she says, in a nutshell, you know, listen, I love you. I, I know how important basketball is to you, and, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a dream of yours, and, and I'm you know, would never do anything to try and take that away from you. I've always been supportive of you, but I'm pregnant. And if you leave us again and you're a father and a, and a husband on Skype for eight months, I'm done. And that was the last year that I coached overseas. I did not fly to that team. And I've, I've been in the Dallas area involved with basketball on the minor league level, semi-pro and, and, and minor league. I'm involved with the TBL, which is the basketball league. Uh, they had a team this past season called the Dallas Skyline, and I was the head coach for that team. And so I'm still able to, you know, participate and, you know, be around the game, but just also able to come home to my wife and kids, you know, at, at the end of the day as well. All right. I'm going to first of all say that it's – a story that we hear quite frequently when we're interviewing coaches here on the pod. And that is that when you're trying to think about being successful as a coach, you're always trying to find, and I don't know if balance is the right word, but you're trying to find an ability to marry your ambition and love for the game of basketball and coaching it with the love that you have for your spouse, your family, that's at home. And we all know that in general, coaching takes up a lot of your time, but not only does it take up a lot of your time, but it also takes up a lot of your energy and thought process and everything that goes into that. And so balancing being a coach with having a family, I think it continues to creep down to lower and lower levels. The amount of time that you have to spend in order to be successful becomes more and more challenging. And I hear that from co high school coaches, especially all the time in terms of, especially guys who have been in the game for a long time, they think back to 15 or 20 years ago and what they were doing in the summer and the off season compared to what they're having to do now, the baseline amount of time that you have to put in has risen. So I can certainly understand your story. I can certainly understand your wife's point of view and why she felt the way she did. And then clearly the decision that you made was to, value your family over what other opportunities might have presented themselves. So talk a little bit about the basketball league, maybe for people who aren't as familiar with it. Just give us a quick rundown on what it's all about, what maybe its mission is, how you got involved in it, and then we can kind of talk about where you go from here. Yeah, so, I, you know, it, it's one of those things that for me, I really kind of got lucky. I, I, I was able to have my cake and eat it too. I mean, it's not too often that you're able to, you know, check all those boxes. And so because um, here in the United States, we have a league such as the basketball league, the TBL, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, it's one of the higher levels of professional basketball in the country. I think only really behind the, the NBA run G League, as far as level of talent and organization, it's a a 24-game schedule, 12 home, 12 away. Uh, there's a lot of teams within the league that have a storied franchise and, and, and history to them. The Albany Patroons is an example. We're a longtime member of the CBA, which, which you know, in its day was kind of thought of like the TBL as being one of the top um, leagues in the United States after the NBA. But Albany has had coaches like, you know, Phil Jackson and, Musselman and George Carl and you know I could go through the list of players too it's just but multiple teams in the league have a tradition or, or play in, in cities that are known to be a, you know a minor league hotbed and 
Last year, we had an expansion team. I found out that a team was coming to Dallas, and my my off-season home, well, my full-season home now, um, <laughs> is is here. I born and raised in California. I, I came out here in the in the early '90s, and it was always kind of where I came home to in the summers. But now that I'm here full time, I, I found out that this uh, team was going to be an expansion team, and I the more and more I looked into it, David Magley and I. David is the president of the TBL. We go back years to when he was a coach for the Brampton A's in the Canadian League. The NBL was one of my stops in, in, in my overseas career. Uh, I was the coach for Halifax, and he was in Brampton. So I, I had a relationship with David. He later um, became the uh, commissioner of the top league in Canada. And then now, past several years, as, as president of the TBL. And so I saw that he was in it and some of the other teams that were involved. And I started getting excited about it because, you know, it's right here in my backyard. And like I said, I can come home, you know, at, at the end of the day and have that, you know, work-life balance that, that makes sense. I still have a, you know, a, a young family and it's perfect for me. I really enjoyed it. What's the best part of coaching at the, uh, let's just call it, a minor in a minor league basketball pro basketball setting what do you enjoy the most about being able to be involved with whether it's the players whether it's the franchises whether it's the league itself the people what is it that you enjoy the most about the experience that you've had at the minor league pro level here in the united states i i, I think it's you know I, I go back to when i was you know with the the dallas diesel and and when i first started going overseas it's that kind of level of guys where they're just on the precipice. These are a lot of these guys were, were, were star, you know, NCAA division one players, ex G league players. Some of them have some overseas experience already. Some are, you know, just right out of college, but they're, they're right at that age where they've got all their hopes and aspirations and they're trying to take the next steps in, in their careers. And because, you know, I have a, a background of, 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 you know, being in a few different countries and having some, some success uh, around the world, I, I'm able to kind of mentor these guys and also years of contacts and relationships with overseas clubs gives them kind of a, a vine, if you will, that, you know, allows me to kind of speak to some of these other people on their behalf and say, hey, come check this guy out. He's really good. I'm going to, you know, connect you with his agent or, you know, send you a highlight or, you know, here's his phone number, you know, that's exciting for me is to see those guys take that next step. I, I've always enjoyed that. Yeah, that's a great opportunity for you to be able to help the guys that are part of the league to be able to use it as a stepping stone to be able to build their career, get to a place where they can maybe have some more stability or make a little bit more money. And for you as a coach to be able to be the conduit to help your players do that, I'm sure is tremendously rewarding. Let's go on the other side of that equation. What's the most challenging thing about coaching at the minor league pro level here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, you know, this is going to sound spoiled, but 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 money, right? Like, you know, if if you're coaching in Europe or or China or even you know one of these top teams in Canada or Mexico, it, it's it, it's a it's a bigger venture. They they it's in a lot of these little towns um, overseas, you are the NBA to them. They, they don't have access to the Mavericks or the Legends. Um, here, we're, you know, maybe the third highest level of professional basketball in this one city. Overseas, we are the Lakers. And so the, the financial, you know, wherewithal that comes with that, travel, flights, meals, accommodations, training practices, access to facilities, income, what guys make, being able to just kind of be full-time focused on basketball is something that becomes easier and easier the more and more assets that you throw at it. I, you know, I hate to, that sounds superficial, but the minor leagues is a different thing. I mean, not too dissimilar. A lot of people have seen movies about minor league baseball. It, it you know, you're on a bus and, and, and you you've been driving for a, a number of hours and you, and you got a hotel in a, in a little town. And some of these guys, you know, have, have jobs, they have bills, they have responsibilities. They've got other stuff going on in their lives. 
And so it's just being able to balance all those things. If you're not a, a first round draft pick in major league baseball, it's probably not that much dissimilar from, you know, playing in the minor leagues in basketball and that it, it's a little bit of a grind to, to, to get where you ultimately want to go. But I think the guys understand that. And, you know, we always spend a lot of time and energy and, and kind of trying to outline exactly what it's all about. And, and for those guys that just want the opportunity to move up in their careers, you, you make some sacrifices early on in order to take that next step. And if they're not spoiled by the trappings of, you know, Europe or China or some other things, and, and, and they're just, you know, looking to take that next step in their careers, then, you know, it's, it's, it's typically not something that, that's going to uh, distract them from what they've got to do. Yeah, I can see where from both a playing and a coaching standpoint, it can be challenging from a money perspective. And clearly it's a place where anybody who's there is thankful for the opportunity at the same time is looking to use that opportunity to be able to get their next opportunity. And one of the things we always talk about, especially when it comes to coaching is making sure that whatever job you're in, it may not be the one that you ultimately think you're going to be destined for, but usually what happens when you work really hard in the opportunity that you're in, then you get an opportunity at the next place in the next spot. And that's how you continue to move up. You don't move up by keeping one eye out the door, one foot out the door. You get opportunities because you're working hard and doing the best you can. I think that goes for players or coaches, no matter where you are, whether that's high school, college, semi-pro, pro basketball, whatever it might be. I think that if you, if you keep focused on what you're doing in the moment, and that's when those other opportunities come to pass. So that being said, when you look forward in what you want to do in your career as a basketball coach, and then you think about balancing that with your family at home, where do you see yourself over the next several years? What do you think about in terms of your career goals, aspirations? Where do you see yourself in five years or so? Yeah, so um, so much of working up in the higher levels of basketball, you know, my aspirations always were to, to coach in the NBA. And, you know, so much of that is kind of who you know. It, it's a little bit of a, of a buddy network, right? You're not going to stick your neck out and bring someone in just because you think he's a good basketball coach. You need to know that who he is as a person and culturally if it's a good fit. And a lot of times it comes from, people who know someone who knows someone and, and has a relationship and can vouch for someone. And so the, the longer you're around the game at a particular level and you develop those contacts and those relationships, the more, the easier it is that those things all kind of intersect between different coaching trees and you're able to just kind of organically grow within that, that level by kind of bypassing really other than high school and junior college, a little bit of uh, minor leagues, but just kind of going straight overseas, I, 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 I've limited some of those things in order to, you know, move up at the NBA level. But um, kind of in the back of my mind, what, what I've been thinking about, if I'm going to be here, is, is helping an organization at the highest level, whether that's in a scouting capacity or whether that's working players out or coming in the video department. I've, I've been up for several jobs. It's something that I continue to to look at and to network and to talk to people about. And so, you know, the NBA is still my goal. That's awesome. That'd be great if you were able to get there, especially with the diversity of the background that you've had. It's clear you're a basketball lifer and I can see you continuing to pursue that. And it's just exciting to be able to have, hopefully at some point, have that opportunity to reach your dream. We're coming up close here to almost an hour and a half. So before we get out, I want to give you a chance to, share how people can get in touch with you, follow you on social media. And then if there's anything that we didn't hit on tonight, you want to make one final point, you can go ahead and do that as well. And then I'll jump back in and wrap up the episode. Yeah. Awesome. So you can reach me at coach Chris Terrell. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but maybe the easiest way is uh, through my website. So I'll, I'll give it to you. It's uh, D one stars dot pro. So D1, like Division One, the word stars.pro. If you go to that website, there's a contact us page. That's, that's my organization, and that might be the easiest way to get in contact with me. But I, I'm pretty easy to find if you, if you ask around the basketball community. Awesome, and I'll put, we'll put all that in the show notes 
when we get the episode put together so that we can make sure that people don't have to be furiously scribbling it down while they're driving their car. We'll have that all in the show notes for anybody who wants to get in contact, reach out and talk to Chris. We can't thank you enough for spending the time with us tonight, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Just got connected to you in the last couple of days and then having an opportunity to dig into your story and all the things that you've been able to do across the world in the game of basketball. A lot of exciting experiences, a lot of experiences that I'm sure have enriched your life both as a basketball coach and as a person. So I want to personally say thanks to you for being willing to jump on with us and to everyone out there. Thanks for listening and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Coaches, we've teamed up with E3 Analytics so you can now purchase three of their exclusive new playbooks. If you're looking for ways to improve your team next season, these playbooks blend affordability with the quality content that serious coaches are looking for. Just visit hoopheadspod.com slash store and you'll find playbooks from Coach Don Showalter of USA Basketball, Coach Mike Flynn from the Illawarra Hawks in Australia, who coached LaMelo Ball last season, and Coach Tyler Whitcomb from West Michigan Aviation Academy. Check out these great resources at hoopheadspod.com slash store. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball. 